Imagine serene waters, trees rustling through the slight breeze, and a blissful ambience that essentially compels foreigners to visit a pond which lies at the end of the 35 meter wide river in central Norway's Pluridin Valley. This place is called Plura Pond. However, its peaceful atmosphere masks the dangers that may transpire from the vibrant cave below. This cave sparked interest for many experienced cave divers, especially a group of Finnish men that wanted to explore their curiosities and discover a new passage under the water. Their fearlessness and exhilarating sense of adventure is admirable, but it can distract these divers from the known hazards that can soon cost their lives. This is their story. Hello everyone, and welcome to my channel where we cover all tragic and terror stories. So if you enjoy this type of content, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button, plus ring the notification bell to be notified of all new uploads. And, as always, viewer discretion is advised. While many people may be afraid of the ocean or drowning, there are a few brave souls who challenge their fears and dive into the great unknown. Diving is a dangerous sport in its own right, but when you add elements like being stuck underwater in a cavern, it becomes another level of extreme. However, cave diving can be rewarding to those who love adventure, as one is able to discover and view sections of the earth many or none have never traveled before. For some, this sense of adventure is just too much to pass up. One of the most known and common risks of diving is developing decompression sickness, which can take place and must be considered when the diver is using a breathing regulator. This is caused by the formation of bubbles, mainly nitrogen, that occur with a sudden change of pressure in divers. These bubbles can affect just about any area of the body. If the diver rises too fast out of the water, the bends will cause serious pain, fatigue, and even death. Even using rebreathers, a breathing device that recycles a diver's carbon dioxide they excel, can cause decompression sickness. To top it all off, divers are always at a risk of basic equipment failure. Just imagine the fear you would experience if your light did not work in pitch black darkness under the world surrounded by cold water. The location of our story takes place in a land of adventure and discovery. Plura Pond in central Norway was special, as it was the output of a 35 meter wide river which ran parallel beneath the ground. If you continue to follow this passage for half a kilometer, it is said that you would emerge in a long, colorful cave. For the more experienced divers, there is a path that leads to a deeper part of the cave that is very narrow. If the deeper path is followed, it will eventually lead up to the surface, almost like a United States Highway U-turn lane. Continuing through this pitch black and freezing cold water, you will eventually emerge in Steinglaflaget Cave. This cave was where the five Finnish divers had planned to exit. The dive was scheduled to take at least five hours in the below freezing waters where any tear to a dry suit would result in hypothermia and death. On February 6, 2014, a team of five skilled divers set out at the end of Plurden Valley with the destination being Steinglaflaget Cave. Patrick Gronkvist, a Finnish diver who was a part of the original trio that discovered the passage between caves a year ago, and his diving friend Yari Huatarinen, a diver who was attempting the traverse for the first time, had been a part of the first group to enter the water. The other three divers, Vesa Rantanen, Yari Uzumaki, and Kai Kankanen, entered the dive a couple of hours after the first duo. This was to wait for the sediment raised by the divers to settle. Little did they know, when the trio of divers entered the water, something terrible had already occurred. With the trio of divers waiting on dry land, Patrick and Yari cut a hole in the freezing pond just big enough for one person to fit. They quickly put on all their necessary equipment and entered the freezing water. After about an hour, the duo had swum through the parallel traverse and arrived at the deepest section. Patrick, the most experienced diver of the two, and the one who had made this journey before, started his ascent out of the deepest area. However, when he turned around to look for Yari, his heart dropped. He saw nothing. 
Patrick began to anxiously swim back down looking for his friend. Yari H was only a few meters behind Patrick, but his equipment had gotten entangled in a cord when trying to go through a small opening in the rocks called a restriction. Patrick could see Yari was in a state of panic as he furiously waved his light around as a signal for help. By the time Patrick got to Yari, the issue was identified and resolved, but for some reason, Yari was not acting himself. Patrick could tell the incident had bothered him more than it should have. Yari, panicking and breathing rapidly, switched back and forth from Patrick's open circuit mouthpiece and his own breathing regulator. Sometime during this exchange, Patrick noticed Yari had nothing in his mouth. Before he knew it, his friend had swallowed water. Patrick watched in horror as Yari literally drowned in front of his eyes. Now panicking himself, Patrick knew he needed to take a moment to calm down. He took a deep breath in, then out. Attempting to bring Yari out at this time would be too dangerous. He became conflicted because if he left his friend there, the trio of divers following him would eventually see Yari's body. Patrick had no other options and a calm washed over him. Yet he could not shake off the sight of his friend drowning in front of him. He continued onward. He had spent more time than anticipated at depth and knew his decompression time was starting to add up rapidly. As he continued into the pitch black cave, he only thought of the trio behind him and the sight that they would soon face. Two hours after Patrick and Yari started their dive, Vesa, the first of the second group of divers to enter the water, was followed by Yari, Yu, and Kai. Once the trio of divers had passed the deepest part of the dive, they approached the location of the incident. Since Vesa was leading, he was the first to see him. He had only a moment to decide what to do, but he was in a state of shock. He began to panic and tried to squeeze past Yari's body since he felt as if turning back was not an option. He squeezed himself between bone and rock, and after 15 minutes of struggle and sheer desperation, he was through. There was a severe problem though. Vesa did not have enough air to make the ascent. As he was nearing the end of his dive, an emergency ascent was made 80 minutes before his scheduled surface time. This brought on an extreme case of the bends, but what other option did he have? Patrick noticed a light coming up from the floor of the cave. He swam down a few meters as a wave of relief washed over him. Vesa had made it through the restriction and passed Yari's body. Deep below the ground, Yari Yu was the second diver of the trio to face the absolute horror. With Kai close behind him, he lost himself and in a sheer panic and act of desperation, tried to squeeze past the body in front of him. However, he was unsuccessful and turned around. Once Kai came around the corner, calmness turned from confusion and eventually into horror, as Yari Yu was frantically panicking, moving in Kai's direction. Kai, still unaware of Yari H's accident, tried to calm down his friend, but he was unsuccessful. Before he knew it, Yari made the exact same mistake as his friend before him. Kai left with no other option at this point but to turn around and begin the long trek back to exit the way the group had entered. He spent hours underwater in the dark with nothing but his own thoughts as he performed decompression stops. For all he knew, he was the only diver alive and was not even sure he could survive. Eventually, he did break through a thin layer of ice. Fresh air washed over him like a wave hitting the shore. Kai emerged from the water three hours after Patrick and Vesa had both exited. Patrick and Vesa saw a light in the distance as they were waiting for Kai. A wave of relief washed over the duo as they learned one more had made it out. Kai informed them that Yari Yu was gone. The trio would contact authorities to let them know what had happened. All three of the survivors had to be hospitalized shortly after emerging from the water due to severe decompression sickness, but they were alive. A well-known British rescue and recovery diver by the name of Rick Stanton heard about the incident and wanted to perform a recovery at Plura Pond in 2006. With the approval from the Norwegian police, Rick and two other British divers attempted to retrieve the two bodies. But once underwater, the group realized the danger and difficulty of their mission. 
Yari H's body was firmly stuck in blocking access to Yari U's body. In order to free Yari H's body, the team needed first to gain access from the opposite side. The only option they had would be to enter the water through the Steingol Flaggett side, make the descent to the body, and then begin the recovery. The group decided that this would be too dangerous and called off the rescue. At this point, the families of both divers were beginning to lose hope. Sammy Pakarinian had been a diving instructor to both victims and had the most experience diving among the original five. Sammy was in Mexico, teaching a course at the time of the incident, but couldn't get the feeling of dread out of himself when he saw the sheer number of missed calls. With divers, there is a camaraderie, much like what is felt in the Marines in the United States Army. No man should be left behind. Sammy called the three survivors of the dive and discussed what had happened below the surface. He and the three surviving divers decided to then retrieve the bodies themselves. Patrick even made Yari H's wife a promise that they would retrieve the bodies. The team knew that this mission would not be accepted by the Norwegian authorities after what had happened with the British divers. They also knew that if the recovery failed, Plura Pond would most likely be closed to divers forever. So the mission was planned in secret. Sammy, Patrick, Vesa, and Kai all had an advantage the British divers did not. They had made the trek, entering from Steingol Flaggett side before, and possessed more knowledge about the area. The main concern was another panic underwater leading to further tragedy, so the team had to gain closure first. Prior to the rescue, the team needed to be disciplined, brave, and focused in reaching one common goal, retrieving both bodies back to their families. The time had come. It was like all tense minds merged into one as they discussed their plan to move the bodies and bring them back up. Sammy and the three survivors gathered a total of 27 people to help assist them in this mission. The whole team was split up into groups, support divers that were on the shallow ends, deep divers like Patrick, Sammy, and Kai that would raise the bodies, and a surface manager, Vesa, who would handle everything from above. The mission would be five days long. An entire day was spent just bringing all of the gear into the cave through a cable up the mountain, then another leaving oxygen tanks throughout the route. A total of 50 gas cylinders would be prepped along the route as well as an underwater habitat which was a pocket of air that divers can use for decompression stops and eating. On the third day, the actual recovery began. Sammy, Patrick, and Kai all entered the icy water, accompanied by underwater cameras. At about 85 meters into the dive, Kai was overwhelmed with anxiety and made the difficult decision to resurface. He reluctantly signaled to Sammy and Patrick that he would not continue quickly turned around, heading for the exit, defeated yet happy to escape this nightmare. Underneath the water, Sammy and Patrick, anxious yet still calm, continued into the darkness alone. One tight restriction after another, heavy breathing, as they could barely see a few feet in front of them, yet both perfectly calm. One last corner, and they saw them, caught in the restriction, floating in space. They passed Yari U first and saw Yari H floating 20 meters away. It had been seven weeks since the divers had died, so their bodies were difficult to maneuver through the water. They started with Yari H and quickly began to extract his body, both calm and sure of their every move. They would only take one body at a time. Vesa waited on the surface, staring at the clear, calm water, waiting for any sign. After hours, he saw the glow of a flashlight, then a second. They had successfully retrieved Yari H's body when nobody else could. It was not until the next day that an attempt to bring Yari U's body out would be made. The divers had to resupply and prepare themselves for another long trek underneath the surface. Today, they would be accompanied by Yanni Santala, an additional depth diver to help retrieve Yari's body. The trio of divers would enter the cave and reach Yari's body with no issues. Sammy and Patrick began the recovery but were having difficulties as Yari's body was not buoyant and had been wedged along the wall. Minutes of struggle went by, increasing their deco time, but eventually they were able to get Yari's body on the move. A sudden noise was heard above, then panic. 
Sammy felt a huge weight of bricks push him down flat against the bottom of the cave as he used his legs to kick himself forward in desperation. They all turned around in horror and realized a rock slide had just occurred where Sammy was swimming. In shock and thankful he was still alive, Sammy rejoined the trio. Shaken up, they had to continue onward and eventually made it out of the cave. They were met by a team of men that lifted the body out of the water and placed it in a bag. The local authorities would eventually investigate this dive as it went against Norwegian approval and was illegal. Although, after procedures six months later, no charges were given. The Finnish president awarded Patrick the first class medal of the White Rose of Finland after being nominated by his firefighter co-workers. A promise had been made to a fallen diver's wife. After a total of 101 hours of diving, that promise was kept. All men and volunteers involved are heroes. This story serves as a reminder to those who want to venture into the underwater depths of a cave that proper training and planning is a must. That day, families were reunited with their loved ones.